So uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to GitLab Commit at the uh, KubeCon. Uh, my name is Itzi Gigan Baruch. I'm a senior technical marketing manager here at GitLab, and uh, I'm based in uh, Israel. And uh, uh, I would be happy, this is my LinkedIn here, my LinkedIn account. Feel free to connect with me and I will be happy to speak with you about uh, anything uh, CI and DevOps. And in today's session, we will uh, see a few demos. I, I will start uh, first with the GitLab CI overview demo. And then my colleague Cesar will continue with the next uh, step, which is uh, GitLab CD, continuous delivery and continuous deployment demo. And then Fern will uh, complete with the DevSecOps demo. So, uh, so we will get a three very, very cool demo. Um, so we will start with the first one, which is GitLab CI overview demo. So uh, in this demo, I will uh, present uh, it via uh, uh, three use cases and three demo flows. One is for the developer, developer flow. The second is the day life of DevOps engineer and the dev team leads. So I choose those uh, three personas in order to demonstrate a little bit about uh, how GitLab uh, can edit those personas and how we, we can do uh, I, how we do um, DevOps with GitLab. So I will, I will start with the developer flow. All right, so developer, uh, the developer wants uh, every day when he wake up in the morning and go to the office, he wants to write his code. Uh, he likes to write code. This is what he, he knows and he wants to make his application and uh, releases as soon as possible into production. In order to achieve that, he wants that his code will be built and tested and get feedback as soon as possible. Feedback on uh, some bugs or feedback on uh, some vulnerabilities that maybe he entered into the code or any uh, compliance issues. So if, if there are some issues, the, the developer will want to know that in advance and not wait a, a few weeks or sometimes even one to get a security, long security report with the many things while he even doesn't understand what it is and he already working on another version of the code and now we need to go back uh, to the original code. So this is what the developer wants. And um, let's see how, how uh, the GitLab flow uh, in the, this uh, case and how the developer uh, make that. Make that right? so, uh, so you see GitLab screen and I will create a new branch and I will give it a name. And uh, this is now my feature branch and this is my source code. As you know, GitLab is a single application for a repository for CI and version control and CD and monitor and security building, everything in one application. So currently we see the, the source code of my feature. And now if I will change something, it will change only my feature branch and I will not impact anything on the shared repository where is the, the main branch uh, that goes to production. So I will open from here uh, my source code. And this is the file that I will want to change in this demonstration. And I will open the uh, built-in web ID for that. And I will change this uh, string to something else. And actually, this is the all, all the change that I do today. And I will commit this change into my branch. And I will add a commit message. And I want to commit it to uh, page update, this is the branch we just created. GitLab offers me by default to start a new merge request, so I will accept that offer and I will push the commit uh, button. And the new merge request just uh, opened for me, and by default, the title is my commit message. I can assign the merge request to myself and I will submit the merge request. So, wh what is this merge request? So now I'm requesting to merge my feature branch into the main branch. And this will go 
to production to, to our end users. And so merge request is like a form requesting something to merge something in the domain. And in order to make sure that there are no uh, vulnerabilities in it or not compliance uh, in it, we can uh, treat the merge request as the quality security and compliance gate into production. So via the merge request, we will um, validate via other reviewers or stakeholders that uh, what gets into the production should they get into the production. If, and if there are problems, we will uh, not merge it into production. And if you notice here, uh, this icon means that a new pipeline already started because I just committed the change. And this is the main thing of CI. For any change, you will run a CI pipeline. So in GitLab is automatically, you don't need to configure anything. Uh, as long as you, when you commit a change, uh, you push a change, a CI pipeline automatically will be started. I will click on that and it will open for me the uh, pipeline graph on, of my CI. And the CI first will build my, will build my code and then create a Docker image in it and push it to the build-in container registry. I will open the container registry and we can see the new image for the my uh, code that already pushed in the container registry. I click in, in it and I can see the image tags of my change. I will go back to, back to the pipeline to see what else we have there. So we build the code and then I added a, a stage and a job to build for me a testing uh, environment. And then another uh, job to ping this environment just to validate that the environment is uh, great. And then I added uh, many tests like quality tests, container scanning, functional tests, uh, license scanning, mobile tests, regressions, and, uh, and, uh, and more tests in that, in that. The next stage is the review. The review is, is it will deploy my feature branch, my code into Kubernetes, and then I will have a live preview of my code. And this preview, I will be able to send to my stakeholders like designers, product manager, QA, everyone that are parts, part of that the review process will be able to see live instance of uh, my changes before it goes to production. And because we have this review application, we have live instances, we don't have to just do a uh, static uh, scans on uh, the code. We're also running dynamic application security testing and even performance testing on the live preview of my feature branch. So as you see, I just pushed the change and I will get all of that after a short time, can be minutes, maybe a few minutes or 10 minutes, I can get the feedback of a change. And this is the idea, every, for every change that you, you will make and commit, you will get the, such feedback. Now, uh, I, I, am, I made my change uh, via the uh, default uh, web IDE, but uh, developers usually like to work with their uh, local IDE, which is great. And uh, in that case, you, can, uh, you will get a notification in email about, uh, about the pipeline status. In this case, the, my pipeline is green, and I got a notification on that. But if I would get an error, I could see here a red pipeline, and I can, uh, from here, click and get into the pipeline graph and see what is the failing uh, job. I'm going back to GitLab and I will go back to my merge request. And as you can see, the pipeline passed. On the right side, you see all of the pipeline stages, which is great. All of them are green. All of my jobs are passed. So I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm in good shape. On the bottom, but the bottom of the page, you can see in the merge request, all of the test results, you see there are no changes to the quality, to the code quality, which is great. You see result of the browser performance test metrics. You can expand those reports, those results, and see some metrics about the performance uh, according to what I defined in the test. I can see that there is uh, some uh, uh, security vulnerabilities in my code. It's not because of that change, because the uh, previous changes, we have some vulnerability in uh, this uh, Java code. 
And also we got a license compliance, uh, detected no new license. It didn't add any library, but the license scan scans all of the external libraries that we add and make sure that uh, the license that developers adding in their uh, code doesn't bring uh, licenses, introduce licenses that are not approved by the company policy. policy. And you can uh, uh, define it in GitLab, which licenses are uh, approved and which licenses are rejected. You can see here, click here to see from here. Um, okay. uh, you can see here a full report of the licenses detected in, uh, in my uh, code. All right. And um, so the last uh, nice thing here, this uh, button, which is very useful, we use it in GitLab always. This is the review application. So this is also in my merge request. I click here and I can see the preview of my application, which, I, which is deployed to Kubernetes. The link is external. I can send it to anyone. So after uh, I, uh, I've seen that everything uh, is OK in my test, I reviewed the, the application. Usually, the best practice is to assign a reviewer that will uh, review your code before you click this button, the merge button. And uh, another tabs, interesting tabs in the merge request is the commit tab, the pipeline, and the changes. The changes shows you uh, all of the code changes, and the reviewer use that to uh, add their comments in the merge request in this tab. So once the review process passed, the developer and click the merge button, and now his code goes into the main branch, and and uh, with the continuous delivery, hopefully, it will go to staging environment, and uh, at some point, it will deploy to production and will deliver it to the end user. The developer now happy can go for a break or a coffee break, or he can uh, go to the next uh, feature that he want to deliver, and so this was the the, the developer flow and. The main flow of the developer and how uh, the CI helps him to to make it uh, uh, very easy without context switch to other uh, applications. We need to enter another logins. Everything comes in a single fluent flow uh, for the developer. So with that, I will turn to uh, my colleague, the DevOps engineer. And the DevOps engineer, his job is to make sure that uh, everything is working. All of the CI is working, the organization, um, the developers can do their job to develop, uh, to develop application and uh, they don't have any CI blockers and they're responsible for the cloud. So they are lucky they're using GitLab and GitLab is a DevOps, DevOps platform that built design for uh, doing a, a DevOps and CI CD. I will start with the, the CI CD configuration. So uh, by clicking here, uh, we see the CI CD YAML file. So in GitLab, the CI CD configuration is done via code, which has uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, and this is the example of a CI configuration file. So let's see what uh, what's existing. It first it starts with the, the global image. So this image will uh, be used globally in each job, uh, unless a specific job in, the, in its definition is specify other image. And uh, those are global variables that we can uh, define for all jobs. And the definition of the stages and the order of the stages. So this will be the order of the stages and you can add or remove any stages that you, uh, as you need. And uh, here is uh, you can include some uh, templates. So in this example, those are built-in templates that they shipped in with GitLab. We have uh, templates for build, test, code quality, deploy, uh, dust, container scanning. Some of them used in, in the example of the developer. But uh, you can also uh, define your CI template and then uh, users will be able to include them on uh, their YAML file. And those are uh, some examples of jobs. Let's together add a job. And um, the job name is test26. And here I define the different image orbit. 
that means that the, the runner machine, when it starts that this job, first it will go to the Docker Hub, we we'll we'll download this image, and that we also uh, we we'll download this uh, service, and then it, it will run this script inside the image. So all of the jobs are isolated, and the other benefit is that I don't have to install any build tools on my build machines because everything is inside the image. So the, the job is clean, and when the job completes, the, the image removed from the runner machine, and it's, 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 this way it's secured. We allow, by permi we allow permissions to developers uh, to change these configuration files. Uh, of course, uh, we can define a, a limit it to specific people, but uh, in our organization, if we want that uh, we want that developers will be able to change this code in order to, for example, to add a test environment or change something in the CI configuration, so they will not have be dependent on a DevOps engineer or a specific per specific specific person that will make those changes. So they can make the changes uh, uh, themselves. And I'm as a DevOps engineer, because it's uh, on the code, can track those changes by going to the commits and see all of the changes. And the, what changes and when and what was the change. And if there is any configuration issue, it will be easy for me as a DevOps engineer to fix that and, and bring uh, the system again uh, quickly. So we discussed about uh, the CI configuration, but how the, 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 the jobs runs. So I will open the CI CD settings and the runner configuration. So the, the build machines in GitLab, we call them GitLab runners. And we have a few types of runners. We have specific runners that you can install on your prem locally. And uh, then you can enable them for your project. So for example, if you have uh, if you have a need for a Windows runner that's connected to a mobile device, for example, so you can install this uh, system and define it as a specific runner. Uh, and also you can add tags to those runners and then in the YAML file, you want to specify those uh, tags and the job will pick only this runner. There is another option also to use shared runner on gitlab.com. So the runners will be on the cloud and uh, it will pick a runner a machine for you. Another benefit of uh, the GitLab runners, they support auto scale mode, which means that uh, this is elastic way that uh, we provision build machine on demand and we'll make sure that always developers will have a build machine available. So they will not have to wait in the, the, on the queue for free build machines. So whenever there, are, there is a demand for a, machines, the system will uh, provision uh, machines with runners. And then uh, after a while, if there are no other jobs, they are, uh, depend on the idle time they define in the configuration, the machine will be removed in order to save resources. So we a little bit understand the, how we configure the, the jobs and how the jobs run via the runners. And uh, for me as a DevOps engineer is the uh, the upgrade of the system, because GitLab it comes with a single application, single installation for all of the components, issue tracking, version control, CI, CD, monitor. So when I need to upgrade something, I will just need the, to, to change. If, it's a, if, I, if I'm using the Docker installation, for example, I will need to uh, replace two Docker images, and that's it. And, I, and once I replace those images, I upgrade those images, it will upgrade the entire system. I will not have to handle the different uh, applications and the integrations and to worry that uh, something will break after I upgrade the one component. I upgrade one is a single installation of everything. It will upgrade everything for me. And, and by the way, GitLab release a new version uh, every month, every 22nd of the month, we have a, a release. And uh, you can Google uh, GitLab releases and see what is about all of those releases. We, each release comes with uh, a post about all of uh, the features. So, and with that, I will uh, move to give the honor to my colleague, the dev team leader. Yeah. 
So as a dev team leader, my job is to make sure that the team is productive. There are no diff, uh, any blockers. And if there are any blockers, I, I will make sure to address them. So I will show you some reports, some analytics that I'm using. So what we see is, is the, uh, the pipeline charts. And this shows me the productivity of the team. It shows me, shows me overall pipeline. What is the successful pipeline and the failed pipeline and the success ratio? And I can see uh, um, pipelines for um, last week, uh, for last month, or even for last year. This report helps me to understand how the team is doing. And I see that the, the success ratio is good. Most of the pipeline are green, which is great. I hope the team will be continue uh, this way. Another uh, useful report is the value stream analytics. Every organization wants to make the cycle time shorter to release the code to production to the end user as soon as possible. With the value stream analytics uh, model in, in GitLab, we can uh, show how much time took for each of the DevOps stages, uh, like planning, coding, testing, reviewing, and staging. Because in GitLab, everything is a single application. We have this data. So we can uh, analyze that, uh, how much time it took. And you can even drill down and see which issues or merit requests were involved in each stage. And if you, uh, if you find any bottleneck, you can understand where it is and uh, try to fix that. And once you fix a specific stage, it will impact the global uh, cycle time. So this is the value stream analytics. And so the last report that I want to highlight, and uh, later on, firm will uh, deep dive into security. But uh, I want to complete because the, as a dev team lead, we want to release fast, but we don't. We don't. We want to release uh, without risk, without any vulnerabilities. So I'm using I'm using the security and compliance dashboard to make sure that there are no any the vulnerability in my dependencies, and also uh, make sure that the, the license compliance and all of the compliance issues are addressed. So we are good and we don't do something that we are not allowed. So uh, with that, uh, I conclude the, my, my part. And just uh, to a quick recap before I, we move to the second uh, part, so we've seen here uh, three personas using GitLab. The first was the uh, developer that uh, created uh, a, code, a code change and they run CI pipeline, got uh, all of the results into the merge request, uh, reviewed the application with his colleagues and merged his code and was very happy to merge it to his users. Then uh, we, we, we met uh, the DevOps engineer that they show us, showed us the CI YAML file where we can configure in a code all of the configuration of the CI CD. Also, we learned a little bit about uh, the runners and that uh, the upgrade of all of this system is very easy and we will get every month a new version of, of GitLab. And last, we met the, um, the dev team lead and uh, he used some analytics to, to measure and make sure the team is successful. So hope you learned uh, something new about GitLab and uh, try it yourself. And with that, I will uh, stop and try to stop sharing uh, my screen. Uh, please share your screen. Thank you and have a wonderful KubeCon uh, and commit, GitLab commit. Have a great day. Bye bye. Hello, can you hear me? I think I'm next, right? I cannot hear you. Sorry. Loud and, yeah, you're loud and clear. Okay, good. So I can, I can start my portion. Mm -hmm. Very good. So uh, thank you, Itzik. Uh, can you, I'm going to share my screen first, right here. And you should see 
a slide with my face on it. Uh, can you confirm, Fern? Yeah, you're good. Okay, you're good. good. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to start my timer. Thank you for joining this portion of the presentation. My name is Cesar Saavedra, and I'm a, se a senior technical marketing manager here at GitLab. If you, if you need to get a, a hold of me after this presentation, uh, you can reach me on Twitter uh, on my GitLab handle or through LinkedIn if you want. Um, if there are any questions that you don't have time to ask during uh, my portion of the presentation. So what I'm going to be covering is um, just like it's a cover the CI portion. Uh, the main focus of that presentation was the CI portion of the pipeline. I'm going to be covering the CD portion of the pipeline. So that's the continuous delivery portion. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about and showing you uh, progressive delivery through uh, feature flags, which is a, a feature within uh, GitLab. So as uh, you saw some, some uh, pipeline examples already uh, that uh, ITSIC showed you, uh, there were many jobs in each of the stages, and uh, I will be focusing, like I said, on the on the uh, latter part of it, which is the CD uh, uh, pi uh, portion of the pipeline, and it's basically all about and all the all the jobs and tasks related to how to uh, release uh, software to production, right, at any time, uh, whether it's uh, VMs, uh, virtual machines, whether it's Kubernetes, whether it's uh, bare metal machines, uh, and or any other type of platform that you have. So what is progressive delivery is uh, progressive delivery is a continuous delivery uh, with fine grain control over the blast radius. Uh, this is a quote from James Governor from Redmonk. And it basically means deploying something to production in a very controlled fashion and with the ability to control also who the audience is going to be for, uh, for that specific feature or for that specific functionality that you want to you want to try out in production. Not too many years ago, uh, testing in production was a big no-no. Um, you know, the production uh, or the uh, system administrators will not let developers touch the production machines. That has changed uh, in, the, in, the, in the last few years with the introduction of DevOps practices, best practices also uh, developers are allowed, not allowed, but feel, are comfortable now to do, to do some testing in production. And uh, to be able to deploy to production, there are many different strategies. For example, uh, you know, there are, there are deployment techniques uh, called, for example, A-B testing. There is blue-green deployment. Uh, there is rolling upgrades. There's also canary deployment. And in this uh, demo, I'm going to be showing you uh, feature flags. So feature flags is basically, uh, this is uh, before, during, and after picture of what production will look like, but basically, uh, the before picture is showing that there's an application uh, with version one that is running in production and you want to include a feature you want to roll out a feature to production feature a and feature b and uh, during the rollout um, you know these features will be introduced in a in a v2 version of the application and then after you feel comfortable and after doing some um, testing possibly and some validation that the feature is working well, uh, you can actually make it permanent and, and get rid of the feature flag so that the feature is available to everyone. And that's basically the after picture that you see there. There are many ways to roll out features uh, in, within GitLab. One of them is based on percent rollout. So the idea here is that you want to roll out the feature uh, to a small group of, um, of users or, or basically to a small segment of the audience. And then as you feel more comfortable with it, you can uh, increase it all the way up to 100%. This is a screen snapshot. We're gonna go through this in the demo on uh, what feature flags uh, look like, the definition of them looks, uh, look, looks like uh, in GitLab. All right, so let's jump into the demo. So here I have a project called Product Manager Spring. This is, a, this is um, sim similar to an inventory. So you have basically a, a table that is going to have products in it and many people will be able to access that table and they'll be able to delete and add uh, line items to it. And each line item is basically a product. That's what it's called, that's what it's called Product Manager. And let me show you first 
the feature flags in action and then we'll go back and review how you set them up and how you how you define them okay so let's uh, see what they look like in action so this is the def this is where you would define the feature flags there is a feature flag here called products in alphabetical in alphabetical order feature flag okay as, as the description its description says it's going to list the products in alphabetical order and here it says that in production so so we're going to have now two two environments in this project we have a staging environment and a production environment and we're able to define two strategies in fact let's just go into into it and, and show you what it looks like here so this feature flag has two strategies the first one is going to be applied to production and in production uh, what it says here is it's going to be a percent rollout so and it says 50 percent of the users using this application will see this specific feature and it's based uh, on uh, available id and the and the uh, and then in the staging environment uh, only the users listed in this list will see this feature no one else and the way uh, to define this list here of users is you go back to the previous page and you would say view feature lists and here i've created a feature list which is called prods and alpha order user list excuse me and there are two users there michael at cfl.r.com and mary at cfl.r.com so only these two users will be seeing the feature in the staging environment like it was defined right here okay all right, so let's now see, let's see if, how this works in the staging product and the staging environment and production environment. So let's just go back to there. So here I have the environments for this project, uh, Pro Manager Spring. This is the production environment and staging environment. So let's review um, the staging. We can do staging first. So in staging, if I remember correctly, only two people could see the feature. And the feature is going to consist on the products being listed in alphabetical order. And you'll, you'll see what I mean when you see the, the feature, uh, the product list. So I think it was um, Michael and Mary were the only ones that could see the feature. So let's log in as Michael. Okay, here, as you can see here, the, the product ID, and there's a misspelling or misspell word there, sorry, uh, is, is uh, the product number four is listed first. And the reason is that the, this name, is an, uh, this list is sort of in alphabetical order. So graphics card happens to be the first, uh, the first one in the order, and then the rest of them come after that. So this confirms to me that Michael is can actually see uh, the feature in production. So let's log in as someone that cannot. Um, let's log, log in as Peter. And as you can see, Peter doesn't see this feature. And we can tell that he's not seeing the feature because the products are not listed in alphabetical order. They are listed by product ID number, OK? And just to make sure uh, the other person was Mary, right? That could see this feature. Mary, like Michael, uh, she's getting the, uh, the feature, which is uh, the products are ordered by name. Very good, so that's in staging. So let's see now production. Now in production, the strategy was a little different in production. We have 50% of available uh, IDs. Okay, so half of the users should get the feature and feature or see the feature, and half should not. So let's go to production. And I've created six users. So let's quickly log in through the six users and see who gets the feature and who doesn't. So the first one is Peter. I remember this is a different environment. This is a production environment. 
So Peter does not get the feature. Let's see, magic. Magic gets the feature. Let's log in as Michael next. Michael gets a feature. Let's log in as Henry. Henry does not get it. And we have two left. Let's log in as Mary. Mary does not get it. And let's look at us, Thomas. And Thomas got it. All right, so just to recap, if you've been taking notes like I have, Peter got it, Henry got it, and Mary got it. That's three out of six. And then, uh, I'm sorry, they, Peter, Henry, and Mary did not get it. So that's three out of six. And Magic... Uh, Michael and Thomas got the feature. So that's three out of six. So 50 got it, 50 saw the feature and 50 did not. Very good. So now let's go behind the scenes. Let me do a quick time check. Okay, let's, let's go behind the scenes. So how do you define a feature? Uh, you saw how this was defined, but what, what's, let's look at behind the scenes. What do we need to do before you can define one of these or declare one of these? So what needs to happen is, uh, number one, you need to instrument the, um, the feature flag within your code. So here is the source code of this application. And if we go into application controller Java, you will see here some logic to set up the feature flag um, APIs. And then here we're, we're using the, this open source project called Unleash. We're basically instantiating an Unleash uh, instance here. And then here, this is the important part. This is the, um, because, we, because we are doing, uh, we need authentication and session replication because we're keeping track of the user IDs, right? So this application has that. And here we're setting up, uh, we're getting the username here that is logged on. And then we are checking here if this feature is enabled, which is the feature that we, we uh, this is a string that we used to define that feature flag earlier that you saw. Uh, then the list of products in alphabetical order. Okay, and this is basically, is, is doing list all sorted, sorted. Else, if the feature is basically not enabled, just list the products in or uh, you know basically by the the way that they are entered in the database which is in not alphabetical order so you need to do this first and then the second thing you need to do is you need to uh go to actually let's just go back here you need to come here and you need to click on configure and then you need to copy this url and this instance id which happens to be the Unleash, Unleash server, uh, think of it as a, a service, basically, as a service. This is the, 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 uh, the, the way to get to the Unleash service that is running for this specific project. And you, the, you, you could declare two variables with those two values that you would copy somewhere. And the variables are defined here. Please ignore these other variables that I turn off so that uh, my pipeline would run faster. But basically you would define um, two variables here. This is where you would put in the uh, instance ID of the Unleash server or service. And this is the Unleash URL, which are the, the basically the variables or the two values that came from this. Uh, pop-up uh, dialogue. 
And then after you've done that, you can actually define uh, or configure a feature flag here by using that you have to use this feature flag name has to match this string in the, in the, um, in the code that you saw. Lastly, I would like to uh, invite you to visit, uh, there is this project that is public called CD Labs Instructions. And there's a variety of uh, CD related labs uh, listed in these in this project. The one what we, that we just, just showed you is called Feature Flags. And this basically takes you through all the steps that you need to do to be able to recreate what you just saw in this demo. Just like Feature Flags, there are other labs related to continuous delivery, about DevOps, about incremental rollouts, canary deployments, uh, GitOps, uh, auto deploy uh, releases, et cetera, and rollbacks. Okay. So that, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you very much. And at this moment, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Fern. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Caesar. So I'm here and I'm going to talk a little bit about security. So hope everyone's doing well. Hope you all had a good breakfast. Um, and let me get started with sharing my screen. So I am going to share. And craziness is happening. So I'm going to go out of there. And here we go. So my presentation is going to be on DevSecOps with GitLab. And my name is Fernando. I'm a technical marketing manager here. And just to say a little bit about me, uh, like different animals. I worked a lot on security, Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack in the past. I come from a software engineering background and now I prepare these demos and kind of help out with all the different security solutions and really show the value of them. And that's me with a goat and that goat's trying to eat my paper. So before we get into it, let's just talk a little bit about the software developer life cycle. So initially you'd create an issue and then developers would work on that issue. So there'd be a feature request or some type of bug and then developers would work and they'd make a feature branch off of the default branch, commit the changes, then the CI will run, unit tests, building the container. And then we have a whole set of different security scans that run. So these security scans run on that feature branch then there's a review app, which is once these scans run, we'll get all, all the vulnerabilities that were detected. And then there'll be a review app and then not included here, there's also additional security scanning that goes ahead and checks uh, the running application. So we'll send a bunch of requests to try to break the running application and we'll get all those results. And then there can be discussion and code reviews and there'll be approvals so we can set for merge requests to need uh, specific reviews from security team or legal if there's any vulnerable code or incompatible licenses detected so we can add further restrictions on that and that's part of our security guardrail solution then once the issue is merged um, it gets merged into the or once the branch is merged and the issue is closed the continuous delivery pipeline runs and we deploy that into either you know, our staging environment and we can run further tests or we can have that deployed to production, depending on how we like to set that up. And then we'll have the security scans run again, just to validate that, that they're not detected again and that there's nothing further within the default branch. And then we can analyze everything through the security dashboard and triage any vulnerabilities and go through anything that you know, we had to release because it was a critical hot fix, but we still wanna know that it's there to work on fixing that later. So what, scanner, what scans were actually run? What security scans were run? So there was SAST, which scans the set static source code. There's dependency scanning, which scans all of our software dependencies. So that would be, for example, in Python, it would be the requirements.txt file, we'd check the versions and see if there's any vulnerabilities in those and we'd report that. Same thing with uh, container scanning. We look at the different versions of your Docker or container images and see 
and all the items within it and see what's vulnerable or not. And we use a vulnerability database. So we use the CVE database. Uh, we use our own, we have our own security researchers as well that add to our own database. And we go from there to detect these different issues for all of our vulnerabilities. We also detect secrets, licenses, uh, instead of just only, so these are all static analyzers that check our static source code, but we also want to check the running application just in case there's something like a, like bad authentication practices or cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that we can't really find within the static code. And we've also added uh, fuzz testing for, you know, static code. So we have coverage based uh, test fuzz testing which will send a bunch of random data to our functions. So it's kind of like, like an extended form of unit testing to find the, where we're not just writing the unit test ourselves. We have random data being passed into our functions. And there's also web API fuzzing, which will send a bunch of random requests to our APIs. So that's, that's uh, our security scans and we continuously enhance different things and add to our security scans, but you can check out that within the GitLab documentation. So now let's add the AppSec engineers and this or the security team and see what their role is within the software developer lifecycle. So the security team's role is to view the vulnerability dashboard, triage and assess vulnerabilities and see uh, what, what their um, criteria is and what their, um, like how, how vulnerable system is and, and how, if they're a high, severe, uh, critical vulnerability, we'll assess all of that. And we can triage and see what developers need to work on. And we can really collaborate. Developers can leave messages to the security team. The security team can approve or deny these messages and they can really keep track of everything going on within a project or even a group of projects. So I'm gonna give you a live demo of this, but just to uh, kind of just give you an overview, there'll be a merge request and you'll be able to see the eligible approvers. You'll be able to see the security scans and licenses detected, and you'll be able to have a license policy. It's like went over this briefly. I'll go over this in more detail. And you can kind of see a developer can see everything within the merge request and be able to continuously push onto that feature branch resolving vulnerabilities before they have a final product. So this doesn't need so many reviews and code to see where the vulnerabilities are. We tell you where they are and the security team can validate that, but your developers will be able to continuously push code until they're resolved and see the results. And once you see the vulnerabilities, you can actually click on them and see a lot more details and you'll be able to dismiss them or create an issue on them for further to work on it in, within the future. And the AppSec engineer workflow, you'll see that they can actually see the security dashboard and they can triage vulnerabilities. They get a bunch of information, they can change the status and also create issues to work on, on it later. And then I also wanna note that these are confidential issues that only those with access can see. And the reason why that's something important is because we won't allude to any malicious actors that this is a vulnerability, we can fix it and then give an update on, hey, this is vulnerable, make sure you update your system. And then we also have the security dashboard to assess the security posture of, um, of a particular project or group of projects. So they get different ratings and this is something that we can show to the executive team. Hey, we had this, um, you know, hackathon and we lowered the vulnerabilities, maybe we should have this more often, or we had to refactor all this code or to introduce these vulnerabilities. So you can actually see uh, events and what may have caused, what may have introduced uh, vulnerabilities on the system. So now let's get to the fun part, the demo. And checking my time. Okay, I got about five minutes or so. So here's a project that I have with all this, all these security scans set up. And it's very easy to, to set up. Pretty much I'm including templates. And then I can either configure these templates via variables or I can configure them with their own job. Like my fuzz target will tell the fuzzer what to do. So here I'm pretty much building the container image. I'm doing coverage based fuzzing. 
running my unit tests and security scans, deploying the staging, then running my DAST and, and API fuzz testing. And you see like, like SAST is just added with this uh, template being included. And I'm also enabling scan Kubernetes manifest the truth so it can scan all my YAML files as well. And I'm adding extra information for the fuzzer and for DAST here. And that looks like this. So build stage, coverage fuzzing, all of our scanner tests. And if, so SAS is per language. So you'll have a different SAS test per language running, but they'll all aggregate into one place within the merge request. And then you see all the point of staging. Then we run DAS on that staging environment and we run the API fuzzer. So within a merge request, I added a new route. And the first thing we see is that it requires two or more, more uh, approvals for license check and vulnerability check. So you can see that we have, let's say, a lawyer here uh, that's going to check our licenses to make sure they're compatible. And we have members of the security team here to make sure that if we detect a, something vulnerable, a critical or high uh, vulnerability, then we can um, block it and they one of these two members must approve before it can be merged. Same thing if we detect an incompatible license. So and these these uh, scans as of recently, uh, these vulnerability check and license check can be configured to anything like what branch vulnerabilities are detected on what severity, um, what types so you can fully configure this. And once we expand, we can see all the vulnerabilities. And I'm just gonna show you when you click on one, depending on the scanner that's used, there'll be different information. Like this one's Python Bandit. So we'll have access to where in the file the vulnerability is. So here you can see that I'm giving too much permissions uh, to the database file. So there's global permissions on this file. That's a bad practice. And I know that here. And why is that a bad practice? Well. I can go here to find out more information and it's a bad practice because it's too permissive um, and anyone can edit it and perform malicious activities on it. So uh, there's more information on that and that enhances developer education. So once I go on here as a developer, I can actually dismiss this and say, hey, this is actually a test DB and need, need to access for this particular reason. So I can add comment and dismiss it. And you see that there's a dismiss label here with information on it. So once this is merged, it'll actually go into the vulnerability uh, dash, the vulnerability reports, and the security team can actually see this note and they can approve it and say, oh yeah, that is the test database. So let's go ahead and approve this because it's not really a vulnerability because of that. So that's one way that they collaborate. You see different information on, you know, Kubernetes manifests, and you can see like dependency scanning looks different, and you can see what the solution is. You can see links to the CVEs and details, and you can see a description. And different things like container scanning do the same thing. They give you lots of links and uh, solutions, and descriptions. And in DAST, you'll actually be able to see the request that was sent and the actual response, and it'll provide you evidence uh, to ha what happened and a solution as well. Um, so we also have coverage-based fuzzing exceptions, so we can see the stack trace and see that there was a not implemented error that came out when we were trying to fuzz something. And API fuzzing, you'll see the same thing. They sent a really weird request here to the API that we set up and we received the 500 internal error. Um, and this was our actual response. So we know that there's a problem there because it's a 500. And I did click on the create button issue on this one. And you can see that it did create an issue that's confidential to actually um, look deeper into this. And we can also create a confidential merge request to work on a fix without letting anyone know, except those that need to know. So now let's go into security and compliance. Let's go into the vulnerability report. And this is everything within the default branch 
that was vulnerable. So we can see all of that and we can actually click on one and we see it's detected. It was detected five days ago. We can see the exact pipeline it was detected. And we can say, well, we know that this is a vulnerability. We've actually tested it. And what we can do is we can go ahead and confirm that, change the status, refresh the page. And you can see it was confirmed just now by me. And so everyone on the security team will be able to see this and they can add a bunch of different comments and kind of go through there. There's also this security dashboard. And this is what I was talking about when, uh, you know, the different vulnerabilities that were introduced over time. So you can see that there was 24 info introduced at this point and there was two medium. So we can see why were they introduced and go to the date of the merge request and the commits and see when things were introduced. So it seems like we are out of time. So I'd like to leave you all with that. And thank you for attending. I really hope you enjoyed this. And, um, you know, this was a great session. I really enjoyed uh, being here with y'all and going over these security features. So for more information about that, gitlab.com is a great resource. And you can see all of our security features within there and just be sure to access that. So um, I thank you all for attending this.